In George and Edinburgh, William Brodie was a successful cabinet maker. Born in 1741, he was to find infamy in the later years of his life as his exploits as a burglar were exposed. Brodie was made a burgess on 9th February 1763 and in September 1781 he became a member of the town council as deacon of the incorporation of rights and masons. But by night, he was a member of a gang of thieves and used the proceeds to maintain his lavish lifestyle and to keep his two mistresses, Anne Grant and Jean Watt, and his five children. He was a man about town, wearing fine clothes and a stylish powdered wig. He was well respected. Both his grandfathers had been Edinburgh solicitors of some standing and his father was a successful businessman who taught his son the art of cabinet making. Brodie's day job as a cabinet maker included making and repairing locks so when he visited houses in the better off parts of the town it was a perfect opportunity to copy their keys and plan the raids with his comrades. Englishman George Smith a grocer by trade turned locksmith from Berkshire, another Englishman, John Brown, also known as Humphrey Moore, and Andrew Ainsley, an Edinburgh shoemaker. It's thought his own criminal career began as early as 1768 when he copied in putty keys to the bank belonging to Johnson and Smith where he'd carried out some work and stole £800 a large sum of money in Georgian Scotland. Two nights later, £225 of it was found wrapped in paper at the door of the council chamber. On another occasion, the amateur thief entered the house of an old lady one Sunday while her servant was at church. She was reading when, calmly, Brodie entered, lifted keys from a table near her, unlocked her bureau and liberated it of a large sum of money. He replaced the keys and bowed before he left. She looked on in amazement and once he'd gone, exclaimed, Surely that was Deacon Brodie. Brodie's father died on 1st June 1782, aged 73, and bequeathed £10,000 in cash as well as at least four houses and the business to his son. Brodie was now a very wealthy man, but his lifestyle was hemorrhaging money. He was a member of the Edinburgh Cape Society, at the time the most exclusive club in the capital. He joined their number on 25th February 1775, but became interested in gambling with cards and dice in a less than reputable tavern at the head of the flesh market close, owned by James Clark, a vintner, where he lost vast sums of money. He also had an interest in cockfighting, keeping cocks himself, again losing money. As a result, he ran up huge debts, even though his cabinet-making business was thriving. One of the houses he was left, for example, was at Gourley's Land, Old Bank Close, which was purchased from the trustee for Brodie's creditors in 1789 by William Martin, a successful bookseller and auctioneer in Edinburgh, who then sold it to the Bank of Scotland in 1793. In the summer of 1786, Brodie met Smith and the pair began to plan raids on houses and businesses in the old town. At the end of the year, the pair robbed a goldsmith's and a tobacconist's. On Christmas Eve, they targeted the shop belonging to John and Andrew Bruce at the top of Bridge Street. Brodie had been engaged by the magistrates to alter the doors of the jeweller's shop thanks to the pavements being lowered. 
In the early hours of Christmas morning, they easily broke in and made off with a haul of rings, lockets, watches, and other jewellery and trinkets. The hall was stuffed into two black stockings and hidden in a manger in a stable belonging to Mr. Henderson, a grocer and friend, in the cowgate. Not long after this, the two increased to three with the addition of Ainsley in August 1787. The gang raided a grocer's shop in Leith, liberating £350 of black tea, which was an expensive commodity at the time. Next on their list of exploits was the stealing of the ceremonial silver mace from the University of Edinburgh on 29th October. This was when Brown finally became part of the gang. On 8th January 1788, they stole silk from Messrs Ingalls and Horner at the cross. Between three hundred and four hundred pounds worth of silk was taken. The next day, a reward of a hundred pounds was offered to find the perpetrators by the procurator fiscal. This was increased to a hundred and fifty pounds on twenty fifth January, at the insistence of Ingalls and Horner. Not only that, but they also offered immunity of any accomplice who turned them in. They then decided on the most daring of all their raids. His Majesty's Excise Office in Chessel's Court in the Canning Gate was housed in a large mansion, surrounded by a wall and railings, but it wasn't secure. Brodie, in his professional capacity, was familiar with the arrangements of the office and hatched the daring escapade but it went catastrophically wrong. All except Brodie were armed with pistols, but Brown and Smith were disturbed as they ransacked an office in pursuit of more riches than they'd found and had to flee the scene. James Bonner, the deputy solicitor of excise, had returned to the office around 8.30pm to get papers he'd left in his room. Finding the outer door on the latch, he wrongly presumed some clerks were still in the building. As he entered the office, Brodie leapt from behind the door, brushed past him and ran home where he changed his clothes quickly. When Smith and Brown realised something was wrong, they too hightailed it and when they alighted, they saw no trace of Ainsley who'd been on watch. They stole just £16. Brown and Ainsley were caught and turned King's evidence on the other two gang members, Greed playing its part. The reward for information on the previous robbery was £150, so Brown went to the Sheriff Clark's office and told them Brodie and Smith were responsible. Brodie, meanwhile, escaped catching the coach to London, then a ship to Holland, but was arrested in Amsterdam, having been tracked down to an inn where he was hiding in a cupboard and returned to Edinburgh. At nine o'clock on the morning of Wednesday 27th August 1788, the trial got underway and lasted 21 hours. The judges were the Lord Justice Clark, Lord Braxfield, Lord Hales, Lord Esgrove, Lord Stonefield and Lord Swinton. Brodie engaged the Honourable Henry Erskine, the Dean of Faculty, Alexander White and Charles Hay, both advocates. Smith's defence were John Clark and Robert Hamilton, again both advocates. There was little in the way of evidence against Brodie, but his house was raided, and there the authorities found the tools of his trade. Brody and Smith were found guilty and sentenced to hang on 1st October 1788. At the trial, a record was made of Brody. He was 5 feet 4 inches tall, aged 48, but looked younger than his years, with dark hair. 
He had dark brown eyes with dark eyebrows, and under his right eye was a scar. He had broad shoulders, but had a slender build, had large feet and a long stride. At the trial, he was wearing a black coat, vest, breeches and stockings, as well as a striped duffel greatcoat and silver shoe buckles. The afternoon was overcast as the men were brought to the toll booth where they were hanged in front of a crowd of 40,000 people, although Brody had said to the hangman to ignore the metal collar around his neck. Although his body was removed immediately following the hanging, it was too late and he was dead. It's remarkable to think he was hanged on the gibbet he himself had redesigned only recently. He even boasted to the crowd that he was about to die on the most efficient kind in existence. He was buried in an unmarked grave at Buclew Parish Church, although rumours persisted that he had in fact escaped as there were reported sightings of him abroad. If you enjoyed this episode of Scotland's History, please like, comment and subscribe. Until next time, thank you for watching.